and I chair the uh, Senate Ag Committee, and I think to get you, Laurie, introduced I'll introduce yourself. myself, yeah. So we'll have the rest of the committee uh, introduce themselves. I'm Ruth Hardy, from, a senator from Addison County. Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Chris Pearson, senator from Chittenden County. I represent Terry Norris. I live in Shoreham. I represent Bessa, Colville, Shoreham, and Whitey. And I was a dairy farmer for 40 years. Tom? I represent Thomas Brown from Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and uh, part of our Springfield. So, to kick this off, a uh, special welcome to all of you. Great turnout. Uh, glad to have you here today visiting uh, the State House and and we've got about an hour and almost an hour and a, well we have an hour hour and ten minutes uh, you know to hear from you folks and and if you've got ideas that you'd like to promote uh, I know Jackie's here and Joe uh, the President of the Farm Bureau, he's around the State House a lot. Uh, Nate, does Jane Clifford work with us? Jane works son? with us, and Bridget Morris and her crew work with us. So, yeah, yeah we're, we're kind of all like the kudzu vine. We're just taking over the State House. Well, <laughs> it pays to have it. The uh, Morrises uh, uh, are around uh, that to uh, make sure that, you know, that you're ideas get brought up to the forefront uh, so and it's good to have help here because we have you know the ag committee in both the house and the senate we've got the natural resources committees in both and, and of course the appropriations committees where it ends up if we need money to do practices so it, uh, it isn't like the old days where you could get by with one part-time person kind of helping out. It's a, it's a big job uh, and uh, the help is certainly appreciated. So Jackie, I guess turning it over to you. And sure, and before we go any farther, we have some unfinished business. In uh, November at the Vermont Farm Bureau Annual Meetings, um, our president always announces the winner of a President's Award, and this is given to someone who's been a strong advocate and voice of agriculture on behalf of our industry. And this year, the winner was Senator Starr, who was not at our meeting, but I do have the plaque, and I'd just like to tell folks who maybe weren't there that uh, Senator Starr uh, first came to the Dome, the Under the Golden Dome, in 1979, last century, so he's been here. <laughs> Representative. So um, he came in in 1979 and he chaired the House Ag Committee from 1985 to 2000. And then he ran for the Senate. He came in as a senator in 2005. He was chair of the Senate Education Committee from 2009 to 2012. And since 2013, he's been the chair of the Senate Ag Committee, for which we are so grateful. It's a wonderful committee. Um, he's got some great folks on there that really listen to to your voices, and um, and it's also, and, and Carolyn won uh, the um, Stephanie Bordeaux Award a couple years ago, which was uh, a strong woman leading in agriculture. So we've, we've got some really good people here who work very hard for all of you. But since Senator Starr wasn't at the meeting, I brought the plaque on behalf of Joe, and the President's Award is given to Senator Bobby Starr for his unfailing commitment to Vermont agriculture. That's a, a pretty nice uh, award. Um, Hold it up. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. When uh, when I first came to the legislature, uh, it was a little bit like to now in farming. Uh, farmers were really in in bad shape. Milk prices were low. Uh, 
some farmers were dumping their milk, uh, protesting, and and so and up in Orleans County, and in Troy, we had some excellent farmland. And of course, I grew up on a farm. I've always, other than one year, have always lived on our home farm, and you know, eventually I bought it. But that's all beside the point. Um, but agriculture, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is probably uh, the most important natural resource uh, and the foundation of our state. Agriculture is it. And uh, when when I first came to, it wasn't always considered a very good or an ambitious committee to to be on and you know this is I think my 42nd year of being on either the House Ag Committee or the Senate Ag Committee and and I wouldn't trade any one of those years for some other committee in the world I mean um, you know we've We've done a lot of good things in ag. Uh, the current use program wasn't really in place uh, for ag. Uh, VHCB was non-existent, and we set that up in, in ag. Uh, at the Vita Long Program, which we have now, was non-existent. We set that up in the Ag Committee. Uh, the dairy, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but uh, the dairy compact uh, uh, we put together and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great uh, run. And, uh, and I sit on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate now, uh, but over in the House, which is it's really important for ag to have somebody in there because the buck stops there. And but over in the house, I never cared about being on appropriations. But I always had people up there that were good friends and and <coughs> considered ag as a very important issue. Perry Wait uh, from. Uh, Paulette was up there for a long time, and Michael Obahoski was uh, chair of that. And so along the way, you know, we've had some, I've had some good partners that that really helped out and, and did a lot of the work. So all I was doing is steering the bus a, a little bit, but it's like, the crew that I have now, I mean, they're the ones that do the work. I just, <laughs> I just try to keep a lid on the kettle. And, and uh, so anyways, um, I want to thank uh, uh, Jackie and the Farm Bureau and uh, for all the help that, that they have provided uh, along the way. And, hopefully will continue into the future. So thank you very much. Um, so we do have people that would like to chat with you about some of their challenges and concerns. We've been going over some of the bills that, that are uh, wandering around the building, both upstairs and downstairs. Um, uh, so I think I'm gonna, we've got dairy, we've got some sheep, we've got some equine folks here, and some beef people. So we'll try to keep them moving along. And yeah. um, if you have any questions, you know, please please ask them, and we'll try to figure it out. So Mary, I'd like you to start. Mary White, I think uh, a lot of you know who she is. Head on up there to the hot seat there. Mary just come back from Austin, Texas. She was down at the American Farm Bureau Federation annual meeting, talking with them about growth management for dairy. Yeah. yeah, so great to be here. Uh, Mary White from Corinth, Vermont. We own and operate a cab at Evermark Dairy Farm. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and just wanted to give you a little update about what happened in Austin, Texas at the American Farm Bureau Annual Convention. Unfortunately, the president of the American Farm Bureau was not able to be there due to his wife's passing uh, actually during the convention after a long, courageous battle with ovarian cancer. 
So uh, we continued the meeting, um, and he was elected for another term, so our best uh, to Zippy Duval and his family. But, um, so the, the convention was well attended. We had over 5,000 people in attendance from across the country. It was myself, President Joe Tispert, and Ann and Jay. They're representing Vermont. Um, as we know, we've really kind of worked with the Vermont Milk Commission on pushing growth management and just trying to start the conversation throughout the country. So it was great to be able to actually sit down with dairy farmers from California, Kentucky, Wisconsin, and all try to get on the same page with this and do something to control our domestic supply. So as a result, we did unanimously pass uh, some policy on the American Farm Bureau side, which supports a farmer and industry driven milk management program. <laughs> so that's huge for us. Um, it unanimously passed on the floor, and that really opens the door for the American Farm Bureau to get their staff on this and start working. And other states have passed similar wording in their policies as well. So it's really encouraging, um, and it really started with us kind of reaching out and starting this conversation on a national level. So thank you for all of you for having your support in the Vermont Milk Commission. Just a few other industries that we talked about. Uh, we did stand up and speak for organic soil to keep the word organic in the soil. And we did pass that by a majority at the national level as well. There was kind of an opposition from hydroponic operations, but uh, we were able to pass that as American Farm Bureau policy as well. Uh, so we considered that a win for Vermont. And um, one other thing, we did pass some hemp regulations on a national level. And the American Farm Bureau is going to be supporting a THC of 1%. So that is going to be an American. 1%. Yes, 1%. Uh, more in line with some of the global regulation. So those are just a few things I want to present to you today. Um, I've got some other people here that want to speak on dairy, but uh, if we have time, I might come back later and we can talk about But I just want to applaud you all for Center Star, your milk and meat labeling bills. We're always strong supporters of those. Uh, so anything we could do to get behind those in the state of Vermont, I think, would be great, since, again, we're not really seeing anything move at the national level. Do you produce any almond milk on your farm? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. You want to be an investor to see how they grow in Vermont. It's kind of hard to help. It was interesting, though. So a lot of these dairy farmers from California, their diversity is growing almonds. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was a very interesting conversation to have. <laughs> So thank you all. I'm going to yield the floor to some of our Mary, was there a, a, I've been a sponsor of the so-called Right to Repair yeah. bill, uh, which mm -hmm. is ag uh, farmers in an in intense way. I think there was a discussion nationally at the, at the meeting, but I, I could be wrong. I know Nebraska had passed a resolution around it. Did that come up? Yeah, just give me a little more background on... Right to Repair is the idea that everything from your cell phone to your tractor, you should be able to get parts and repair it yourself, not bring it to the dealer necessarily, which is really hard for us in, in rural state where you know you can't go necessarily to authorize repair people. Yeah. And so it's the idea that you should have access to parts you pay for the tractor or for the cell phone or whatever. Um, so this has been a national discussion of kind of trying to help our independent repair shops, help farmers who know their own tractors but are frankly banned from working on them. Um, so maybe it didn't come up. Or so I think there was some discussion on the floor, but I wasn't present for that. Um, we'd okay. be happy to look into it. And Please. when we get the policy book, yeah. uh, we'll let you know how it stands nationally. There was a lot of discussion when I was on the floor about broadband internet yeah. and getting that to rural communities. So that was one thing that they were definitely in support of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, other questions? <laughs> Just a really quick one. You mentioned the, the word organic. In the, is it in the definition of soil, or what? What so to mean keep the this? organic to keep the definition of organic in the soil. So with the soil components um, being the driver behind that, rather than a hydroponic operation or something along those lines, using an organic certification. I see. Okay, I so, see. Got it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Thanks for your hard work on that supply. Yeah, they're very stuff. excited. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Heidi Krantz, and I'm with the Vermont Horse Council. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all again. Um, I wanted to speak uh, very briefly to the H-254, the Adequate Shelter. Um, we really appreciate all the work that has been going into that 
um, particular piece of legislation uh, and feel that the wording that you've settled on, you've done an amazing job of trying to make a one size fits all for all the kinds of livestock that it has to cover. Um, and understanding that there's never going to be an absolutely perfect piece of legislation that can cover all that. But um, I, we've had some of our members and constituents, I think, write in and call in to give you some feedback on it and appreciate the work you've done on that. Um, yes. I also wanted to update you. I think I've spoken before both committees in the past about our economic impact study, which uh, the Horse Council started back in 2018. And we finished the first phase of that, which was a study that looked at the impact of events, equine events, in the, um, in the state of Vermont. Uh, I sent, had uh, forwarded to you our executive summary uh, to give you some background on that. The full report is available on our website. Um, but the, probably the two main important facts that uh, hit me from it was that we, um, there's an estimated almost 9,000 people that in 2018 came into the state specifically for equine related events. The total impact that they had was almost $22 million uh, in the economy of Vermont. Um, so that's uh, an, an average of $2,400 per group that came. So the impacts there and the potential uh, for growth of that part of the economy in Vermont is, is fairly significant if we could take advantage of a little bit more of the tourism piece of it. We are um, next week at the Farm Show going to be kicking off the second phase of the study, which will look specifically at the economic impact of owning horses in the state of Vermont, and it will look both at personal uh, ownership but also equine businesses and the impacts that they have. So we're hoping that by the end of this summer, we'll have a whole new set of data for you about that, which I think is going to provide even more um, valuable information in terms of the, what the opportunities are with the equine industry. And, and answer some questions that we've, uh, nobody's ever been able to seem to answer, like just how many horses are there in Vermont and what is the impact? And then finally, I wanted to put in a, a word uh, some years ago, uh, the um, Extension Service lost its equine specialist and uh, has not been able to replace that person. We are approached regularly about the, that lack. And if there, I know that we're in tight, very tight budget times. I know that that's a difficult position to look at, but we would love if there was ever an opportunity to um, have some have an opportunity to have that position refilled. It's a valuable position. It gives us access to nationwide outreach that we just don't have now and um, support that we've really been missing. In the past, the study that the Horse Council just undertook was undertaken by extension, and they didn't have the ability to do it. So the Horse Council, as a very small nonprofit, um, raised the $25,000 that was needed to do that study. Um, and, and hasn't had much uh, help from at all from the state other than through the Center for Rural Studies who's um, been very generous at working with us. So thank you very much for your continued work on behalf and we really do appreciate um, your consideration of equine uh, concerns. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Are there any questions for Heidi in regards to the point? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Rob Carey from uh, Wallingford. We have a small sheep farm down there. And <clears throat> first, I would like to thank you for supporting agriculture, farming, logging, and other traditional land uses. I recently saw where there was a special working group or a committee. They were working on water quality or some related subject. And when I saw that Senator Starr was a member of the committee, I knew that our interests were being well represented. And I know that both agriculture committees are working very hard to keep agriculture in all its forms here in Vermont. And I saw a nice picture of you with your sheep upstairs in the cafeteria. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I work close. Hey, that's, that's some part of being a farmer. Um, we've talked about the shelter bill a lot, um, but just, and I think I'm preaching to the choir, but just so you have somebody else here, it comes from somebody else. 
not all animals certainly need uh, four walls or whatever specific shelter might be specified here in Vermont on a 24-7, 365 basis. And a lot of animals actually do better unsheltered in moderate weather and are less likely to have respiratory and other problems such as pneumonia. And really, most livestock owners out there know what their particular livestock needs and how to care for them. And there are always going to be some people who are either don't know or just aren't doing the proper thing, unfortunately. But, um, and the, uh, on the TCI, um, this seems to me like another name for carbon tax, which I'm personally opposed to. Uh, and here in Vermont, we are very proud of our rural character and transportation is a very necessary part of that. Consolidation of services such as schools and shopping actually increases our need for transportation. Uh, and any increase of fuel cost is probably going to be a regressive tax, especially to rural residents, because they need to travel farther on a daily basis than urban people usually do. Uh, farmers, loggers, and other people working outside will often bear the heaviest costs and are, in a lot of cases, the least able to afford it. And um, one of the other commentaries I'd like to make is a lot of times I've seen over the years, and I'm sure you have too, where what start out as suggestions and guidelines and best practices and recommended somehow seem to evolve into uh, requirements and mandatory regulation. Um, and my personal number one concern for our children and grandchildren is that there will still be an economy here in Vermont where they can find uh, jobs to live on. That's all I've got to say. Yeah. Um, questions for Bob? Uh, I guess a question, Bob. Sure. Um, Senator Starr told me about um, the idea of wool and insulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was intriguing to me because we're always thinking about food, really. Um, and, and I'm just curious if you're aware of Vermont um, wool producers that are part of that sort of, I'm assuming that's a, a newer, idea, it's sort of an old idea and then maybe a new idea all at the same time. But. Uh, I'm aware of a little bit, I know there's, there have been at, at least two, I think, um, attempts uh, within the last 20 years or so to do that on some form of a commercial scale. Uh, typically it would be used for lower quality wool. Right. Um, and Last I've heard, in fact, we talked a little bit at our recent sheep group uh, meeting, it seems that there's just not enough of a commercial market to really make it go. It's hard to compete with uh, fiberglass and the big money there. Um, but it has been tried. It's certainly something that might have a future. But right now it seems to be on something that hasn't quite reached its time to boom. Thank you. Well, in this this very morning, um, we heard the University Extension Service. They're working on dirty wool, uh, working that into the soil as, uh, in a, as an alternative to uh, commercial fertilizer. I think they were saying. I, I, I've heard uh, some sort of a, some sort of a pellet. Uh, I'm not familiar yeah, with all the details of it. Uh, which is being uh, being tested as a possible uh, feed supplement, yeah. and also as a soil stabilizer in yeah, places. Yep. Yeah. Um, so those are two, those are things that I'm aware of. People are are testing. Um, I haven't heard they're still working on it as to whether it's truly going to become commercially viable. It's always it's always been looking for things. So are we going to be able to have sheep and cows, or are we going to have a little battle? Oh, well, you know, it's one of those things that like, it changed over time. Uh, a while back, there were sheep were uh, the, the, the heavy numbers, and uh, then out west they started getting cheaper places to graze. And then, in more recent times, the uh, commercial wool market in the U.S. pretty much collapsed. Um, uh, the petro guys took care of that. That and the uh, imports from uh, Australia and New Zealand were heavy hitters in that uh, change. So and anything I think I, for else for Bob? And I don't think there's currently a uh, small ruminant specialist in the extension service either. Mm. Mm. Extension just needs a ton of livestock. What's the market? How's the market for high-grade wool these days? 
Uh, in, in terms of like a, a, a full commercial market where uh, a group of you know small growers would get together and there's somebody that comes in with a tractor trailer by, by tractor trailer loads, right. it's pretty much non-existent. Every couple of years somebody tries to get something a little bit going, um, but there really isn't that full ongoing like it used to be 30 years ago. Um, so it's kind of up to small groups. So what we do with ours, um, we some of it we just clean very lightly and sell to hand spinners and other craft people. Um, a lot of that sale actually have some of it is in New Hampshire and Vermont at their sheep and wool festivals and a big fleece show down at the uh, Big E grounds in uh, Massachusetts. Um, we also take and have some of it uh, more cleaned, uh, more cleaned, so it can be used for, as is. And my wife makes a lot of crafts that we sell at a variety of craft shows. Uh, so those are some of the things people are doing at, for the higher quality. Uh, but as far as um, actually make, being being a part of like a Johnson Woolen uh, shirt like I'm wearing, it's probably insignificant or less. What about me? Me? Ah. Um, there are places that uh, in Vermont that will commercially slaughter and ins under inspection uh, lamb for sale. Um, we've worked with several places, in, including in, in years past, we've worked with um, a food co-op that had a good market uh, down in Boston and New York, but then uh, uh, wasn't able to keep going. So as far as what we personally do for me, our meat sales, if somebody you know, comes and buys something on the hoof, whether they use it for breeding or for meat after it's on their truck or trailer, that's entirely their business. Uh, but we do sh usually ship uh, some lambs down to Northampton in Massachusetts for auction, and I'm sure most of that up ends up on a plate. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jennifer Lambert from Washington, Vermont. Uh, my husband and I operate a hundred cow organic farm there. You aren't on the, you aren't one of them on the ridge, right? On the ridge? Yeah, so one side you get a manure pit and the other side you don't, you aren't one of them. We're on the Champlain. Valley River Basin. So you got your pit? Uh, yeah, we got approved for a pit, but yeah. then we it's Mary that denied, Mary our, we denied our pit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, we're at the line. We're on the good side of the yeah, line. Yeah, you're on the good side. <laughs> but I remember that from last year. So uh, we milk just over 100 cows in Washington, and then we also have a custom harvesting business. Um, so we're in a contact with many farms in Washington County, Orange County. Um, and today I just mostly want to address the use of Roundup in pesticides. And uh, it might seem strange as an organic farmer, but I am opposed to limiting the use of these products for farmers. Um, I believe that we are in the midst of an anti-science movement Fear-based claims are ruling social media, which is where most people get their news from, um, and it's pretty scary. But I think Roundup has its place in responsible farming. Without Roundup, we're not going to be able to do things like cover crop and uh, no-till. Like, that'll just be impossible. <clears throat> uh, we actually tried growing organic corn for a few years, and it was just futile. The amount of diesel fuel that we used trying to cultivate the crop, trying to keep the weeds down. It, it was impossible. The, our last year that we grew corn, it was so weedy that we had to mow it. We had to get the mowers out, mow it down, and put the grass head on the chopper because it was it was just such a impossible crop to harvest. You, you tried to do it the right way? Yeah, the right way, the safe way. Yeah. And the corn was about as high as I stand and barely had any grain on it. So, limiting these products to, from far, sorry, I'm fighting a cold, I'm half here. Uh, limiting these products, it's just going to harm the farming community. We're going to 
not be able to grow other crops other than grass. And so we're going to be more dependent on other states for grain and things. Um, it's just going to make it impossible to farm. Um, so I think there's a place for pesticides and Roundup and many other tools that we probably haven't discovered yet. I do think that a Roundup doesn't belong unregulated on shelves for consumers to buy. I mean, there's nothing saying that you couldn't use three gallons of Roundup on one dandelion on your lawn, really. And it, I think it's very overused. Um, so we're not in a place yet to go without Roundup. We don't, hopefully there's gonna be more tools that we can use, but we're just, we're not there yet. Um, so farms will become, Vermont farms will become more dependent upon other states for grain um, and fuel. Um, so we don't have the tools to grow crops other than grass in Vermont without these tools. Carver cropping and no-till will be impossible without these tools. And I'm just urging you guys to please continue making decisions from the wisdom of the science community, not um, from a place of fear and misunderstanding. Um, Farmers need to feed the world, and we're going to need as many tools as possible to do that. So. Uh, questions for Jan? Can you sell your milk to We uh, sell our milk to Organic Valley. Organic Valley. Yeah, we're still under quota, yeah. which is, how which is, is that, choking us. How's that going uh, <coughs> price-wise? What's that? Price-wise, is that? Uh, Price-wise, we're getting 35 right now, but we're in our our high. We get three dollar premium for December, January, and February. We'll get it taken away in March, and then in the summer we get two dollar deduct for what they call spring flush. So we barely cash flow during the summer months. Yeah. So it we gotta pocket all the money that we get this time of the year to. Oh, get through sad. the summer and then hope that our farmers <laughs> keep sending their yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, sure. So I, I wanted to ask you about your uh, about the Roundup um, testimony. So as you as a farmer, as an organic farmer, you can still use Roundup? No, you can't. Okay, so whatever you use it on, you wouldn't be able to count it as organic. Or yeah, like we, uh, or so we have a custom harvesting business, so we do a lot of, my husband does a lot of work for other farms, plants corn. Got it, okay. Does So I'm assuming you and your husband <coughs> have to have our certified pesticide, uh, you have to go through the training in order yeah, to be able to use the Roundup, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, he's been through the, the trainings and the farms that he works for have been through the the trainings. Uh -huh. And last year we worked on a bill about neonicotinoids, mm -hmm. as you probably know, and we took the route that you suggested, which was to not allow cons sort of regular consumers to, to use it, but still um, certified operators like mm -hmm. farmers or um, golf course owners and stuff like that to use it. Um, is that something you, I, that's what it sounded like you were suggesting for, the, for glyphosate? Did I say that right? Yeah, <laughs> which they already do now, I think, yeah. if I understand that right. No, you can buy glyphosate. Yeah, you can still buy it. You can still buy it. Yeah. As I can go buy it and use it. Right, that's what I'm saying. As a consumer, you can just go buy it by the bucket. Right. But right. <laughs> so what I'm, I'm just trying to clarify, what I heard you suggesting is kind of the root that we took on the unit continuous, which was to not just allow sort of average Yeah, use it responsibly so that yeah. it's when we don't use these products responsibly is when they're going to stop working. So <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, that's, I just wanted to make sure that's mm -hmm. what I was hearing. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Nope. Thank you. Tom. Oh, Tom. It's good, Jen, it's good to hear you asking for the uh, use of Roundup. It's kind of the first I hear it. I, I get emails, and I'm sure we all do, on the other side. And but I have a question. I, I have not used it on my dandelions for three years. <laughs> and quite frankly, my lawn looks like hell. What should I do? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I bet you have a good crop. <laughs> you got to mow it more. <laughs> Dandelions are beautiful and they're good for pollinators, so just leave them. Yes. <laughs> they're the first food for the bees, so you have to leave yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving the bees. <laughs> yeah. Be proud of yourself. You need a sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> thank you. Right. Looks well, like yeah. hell, but I'm saving the beef. <laughs> yes. Morning. 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 Um, I'll start. She's awful nervous. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not really nervous. nervous. <laughs> this is my daughter Anna. Yes. Um, so my name is Justin Poulin. This is my daughter Anna Poulin. Um, we run a small dirt by farm in Randolph. We have 45 beef cows, 5,000 maple taps. Um, and my days in agriculture are numbered. I've been too rough on my body. And um, I'm at the point that I wanted to exit agriculture. She graduated high school last year, um, tried uh, dipped her hands into uh, child care and a couple different things and decided that she wanted to continue the farm. So we've kind of made an arrangement that I've given her a period of time to try it, take on some responsibility, and um, decide if that's what she wants to do for the rest of her life. Um, so we're here today to talk about a little bit about the struggles of agriculture and one of the biggest things we're facing right now on our farm in regards to regulation and new mandates coming and, and repressed uh, commodity prices, whether it be beef or maple syrup, um, those are all things that occur on a daily basis. But our biggest thing right now is we're doing more land further away from the farm. So we're on roads more than we've ever used to be. Our farm equipment has gotten bigger because we're trying to do more with less help. We don't hire any on-farm help. We crop over 400 acres. Um, a lot of it we only do once um, because of the quality of the land, but um, we're still covering a lot of ground. She is lucky to be here today um, because of a uh, accident that happened on the roadway with an altercation with a, uh, another vehicle using the road. So we're here to try to raise, raise awareness and get the um, discussion um, started about um, rights of ways on, on the highways and who has that um, right of way. So we're, there's some language and um, we made up these really neat signs. Um, there's language in 732 that talks about the right to farm law, about um, section three, I think, line G, about um, farm equipment being able to use the ro roadways, but it doesn't give clear language to who actually has the right of way. And um, so this is just her accident. She was towing a tractor, which she had a tractor and a, um, I'll yeah. pass that around actually, and a, and a manure spreader last spring. And we were going an alternate route to try to avoid the mainstream traffic. And um, it was just probably not the best route to be going with that size of a load. Um, she had a car behind her. I'll, I'll let her tell the story. but. It's becoming a daily um, issue for us, confrontations with cars, whether it is 10 cars behind us, or we're trying to make a left-hand turn um, into a field, or um, whatever it might be, it's just becoming a real safety issue. And there's no real clear statute that says who has the right of way, and I've had <coughs> discussions with my insurance agent and local police, that if we actually pull over and try to let cars go, and which is very difficult for us because our equipment is wider. Um, there's really not safe places to pull over. We can't get off the roadway um, far enough. So if a car goes around us and there happens to be another car speeding around wherever we pull over, we're actually potentially liable if something happens to that car because we've gave the indication that they can, they can pass us clearly. Mm -hmm. So I'll let her tell her story about her accident and then we'll answer any questions. Yeah. So with the accident, I was headed up to, with a load of manure, to dump it off in a field. And I was going up the back road and there's a bridge. And before the bridge, there's a pullout. And then right after the bridge, it's an immediate um, incline. And the car that came up behind me, I felt pressured from it to go faster. So I went up the hill in way too high of a gear. And then when I went to shift down, the tractor stalled. Uh, now that didn't work too good. So the tractor, she actually kept it in the, the ditch and the car was able to move backwards and get out of the way and she almost had it off the side of the road. Um, but then the spreader caught a tree, the tractor jackknife, drawbar broke off the tractor and the tractor went over a 20 foot bridge and bank. She landed, got ejected out of the tractor, the tractor rolled over the top of her. So if you don't believe in faith, um, if you saw that accident, you would definitely change your opinion so did you have your seatbelt on no so that is our fault did you have a roll bar yes so we've learned we've learned multiple, we've learned multiple lessons um 
in regards to um, an understanding about second chances. So seat belts are on the priority list. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's, it's, that's an important thing. Um, but it's- The roll bar is no good unless you have your seat belt on. Correct. Um, there's a picture of there's there's a picture of a dump truck there also. Yeah, that? So that was a friend of my neighbor of mine. They were hauling corn last fall. Met a car on a kind of a corner. The car wouldn't yield or get over. So he stopped, and when he stopped, the roadside shoulder gave out, and the truck tipped over over the bank. So well, that's how the trucks. In the end. Yeah, that, so that was just another example of you know a confrontation that you know. Um, and I almost got in a, a physical altercation with a fellow last year. Um, we were spreading manure, and you all are aware of the manure ban, so we had to put our manure spreading on hold because we got all that early snow and the ground became froze. So it was about a week, and then they lifted the ban because um, we were still before the December 15th deadline. And um, so we were moving a truck, so finally we were gonna spread again, but the roads were all ice. And I was moving a tractor from one location to another, and a gentleman got behind me. And there was no way I could pull off the road because if I pulled over to let him go by, I would have slid into the ditch. And uh, pretty soon he started blinking his lights and blasting his horn. So I thought something might be wrong with the spreader. So I stopped, and and then it, he just lost it with me on how he had a place to go and, and whatnot. So, Carol. So I've been I've been taking testimony from you and Anna since she was way smaller. <laughs> and I just want to say I'm really glad you're alive. <laughs> and please wear your seatbelt. And as I said earlier, before some of our folks got here, um, that means we have a roll call vote and we have to go upstairs. And I want to say thank you to everybody for coming today. We really love hearing from you. I've been taking notes for the first time on this thing. And, uh, <laughs> And I, I appreciate your input. And please will you please know that we are always available to you uh, through email or phone calls. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll excuse the house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can stay. We can <laughs> stay. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Thank you Bobby. Bobby. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Tell them to shut that ringer off. That bell's annoying. You know, we, we've also had uh, testimony from Fairmont Farms uh, over in East Montpelier. They've had several challenges with uh, the interpretation of some of the, the laws of farming, farm equipment being allowed on roads. Um, and so this is, and I'm sure any farmer in here can tell you of their own challenges um, with it's, it is a challenge, so. Uh, um, I got Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, thank you for coming. I know how hard it is to just come and testify, let alone to tell such a hard story. And I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, I rolled a tractor when I was a kid, too, and it's really scary. Really, really scary. Um, uh, and I've heard from a lot of people on, well, not a lot, a few constituents on both sides of this issue, um, as you can probably imagine. Um, so I'm interested to learn more and, and also the interpretation issue that you mentioned, Jackie. Um, but I wanted to ask you about something else, if that's okay. Um, you're from Randolph, and so, and you're thinking about taking over your dad's farm, and I'm wondering if you have taken advantage of any of the um, courses or, or um, programs at Vermont Tech um, their ag programs or any or or CCB or any of the um, higher education options that are available in um, and if you haven't so why not and what what is there a barrier to you being able to do those programs or is it just something you're not interested in or I just know that I haven't like looked into that so. yeah is there a lot there are a lot Vermont Tech has a lot of really great programs for farm management and operations and um, uh, they have a program where you do two years at Vermont Tech and then two years at UVM and I know um, students who've done it and it's been a really valuable program for them and it's tuition free um, you can do it without if you get into the program it's um, so anyway I just encourage you to look into that especially since you're right there um, and I think it's a you know will help you sort of with the whole farm management operations um, and um, 
you know, good luck and congratulations. I think it's a great thing that you're wanting to go into farming. Good uh, to see young people wanting to do it. I don't want to answer for her, but she, we have two daughters. One was very, one only applied for two plus two, but she actually, yeah, that's what was, it is. Yeah. Um, the older one, but she's probably not the most one that has a favorite home for school. Um, but she did do her CDL course this summer, and she did get her CDL. Oh, that's good. So she, yeah, yeah, that's great. She's licensed for everything but has been. So. Excellent. Yep, that's good. Um, any? Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and good luck. And if you made it through that mess with the tractor coming up here is a breeze. That's not what they think, though. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Art Whitman. Good to see you, Art. President of uh, Benedict County Farm Bureau, and past president of Vermont Feed Dealers. I've been involved with farming for over 50 years, running a family feed business, and I uh, sold it a few years ago. Um, I just want to make a few comments. It's kind of, I think it's kind of ironic that the state spent thousands of dollars to we do the statue on top of the dome, and it's the, it's the goddess of agriculture, and yet we seem to be um, in a constant pressure to um, tell the farmers what they can and can't do, and so on and so forth. So, um, I, my first comment is about the uh, medical monitoring of the toxic release thing. I know that f it, this. Uh, specifies that farmers are exempt from this, but it doesn't say anything about the about the infrastructure that supports farming. For instance, cabbage cheese, wa uh, washing their stainless steel equipment to make sure it's safe and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure uses some pretty hazardous materials. Uh, even the feed industry, we put in some uh, some chemicals into feed in very small amounts, but it does say hazardous material on the bag and so on and so forth. Uh, the insurance company, uh, I went to the insurance company when I first saw the bill and they said, well, I don't know if we would actually insure you with this type of language, especially um, the, the medical monitoring, but that's, so I, I just want you to be aware that maybe, I, maybe farmers are exempt from this, but not farming industry is not exempt. And we, we do have our legal person scheduled uh, to come in, I think, I believe it's Next week. Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, maybe, of ne is it Wednesday? Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday of next week to kind of lay that out for, for us and to answer those kind of questions because, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing it. Well, you just said both ways, and and it's important that we try to get that right. Uh, and, and my next comments are are on the uh, oh, just sorry. just before you leave that. Um, I, I guess a, a couple of thoughts. There are other states that have a, a similar sort of medical monitoring, and, and so businesses get insured there. I think I think that's worth talking about with your insurer. And the other thing that has complicated this discussion for us is that there was a court ruling yeah. that's sort of three quarters ruled, he hasn't finished, but it seems pretty clear to us that that would be way less protective. If, if, you know, if, if we don't pass this bill and the court ruling stands, the court ruling then kind of becomes the de facto rules. And, and I don't think there's too many people that disagree that that is uh, less protective of farmers, at least. So we're trying to weigh that, and, and I would just invite you to, to understand that yep. it's not just yes or no, right? It's, it's which one is the better solution for us. So. Good. Yeah, thanks, sir. And, and then, uh, of course, the, uh, the pesticide things, the neonics, uh, which are a big improvement over organophosphates uh, and that sort of stuff. Uh, Treated seed, a lot of times there's other things other than neonics in a treated seed. Uh, Captan, uh, sometimes there's enzymes in there to enhance growth and all that sort of stuff. So um, we want to be careful about painting a lot of things. Uh, the chlorof uh, 
um, pyrifos. Um, I understand that that is actually uh, um, Mr. Kajir uh, is already taking it off the market, um, but it's there in case we need it. Uh, a lot of people here don't remember what army worms can do. I mean, I've seen just devastate whole farms, and so we want to be a actually be able to use something like this if, if necessary. Uh, and and then uh, glyphosate. Um, how is it that uh, somebody can sponsor a bill a few years ago that wanted regenerative ag, which meant that you did no-till planting and cover crops and all that sort of stuff, and then sponsor a bill that would eliminate glyphosate, which is what you have to use for all those things. Uh, and I think you've, actually you've taken testimony that you've never found glyphosate in any of, in the environment. Um, and all the tests they've done and all that sort of stuff. So is this a public health thing? And if, if it is, it's rather interesting. When I was looking uh, for all the information I could find on the uh, chlorophos, I happened to run across the statement that said that uh, pesticide applicators as a whole were found to have 50% lower cancer risk than the general public likely due to their nearly 50% lower smoking rate. So if we're really worried about public health, why are we uh, encouraging smoking pot? Why are we uh, letting people smoke cigarettes? These are known carcinogenics. So if, if this is a public health thing, I think we should start someplace else. So start banning that pot smoke. That's worth well. <laughs> it goes up every year. <laughs> Uh, questions for our oh, no. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you for your time. Yeah. Is there anybody else here that would like to open? Yeah, sure. Anybody from this side? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take it off. Go. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Bruce Hallett. I have a money losing sheep farm in East Montpelier. Uh, I also have a full-time job for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, but I'm speaking for myself entirely, so just be aware. I've learned a lot of things from my job, but this is about me. So uh, the first thing I, I want to just, there's a couple things I want to talk about. One of the things that's interesting to me generally, I try to follow the legislature, um, but boy, it's gotten hard recently. There's just so much stuff that comes down the pike. And it, to me, that's, just that by itself is not a very good sign. I mean, it's, Every day. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and it's just really hard to keep track of the changes in regulations. And you know, we, as a small farm, we don't have a compliance officer. We don't have somebody whose job it is to make sure that we stay in compliance with the regulations. We can't. I mean, everything that happens on the farm is my job. And I have a full-time job anyway, so it's pretty hard. So if there's a good reason for things, great. Um, I want to just quickly talk about some of these chemical bans that have been proposed. And Senator Hardy, I think what you were talking about is a framework for making it harder for the general public to use some of these things, but allowing certified applicators is a good framework for looking at some of this stuff. It's like, yes, there's overuse of a lot of these chemicals, but outright bans, glyphosate, for example, not only is it necessary for no-till agriculture, um, basically, if you ban glyphosate, you're banning corn growing in the state of Vermont, which, you know, maybe that's what the goal is. But if that's the goal, then just ban corn growing in the state of Vermont, because it's basically not going to happen without it. Um, it's also necessary. It's one of the most commonly used uh, chemicals for invasive treatment. A lot of late invasive shrubs like honeysuckle and buckthorn and bittersweet and all these things that are taking over our woods. The preferred method of treating these in most cases by the certified applicators that are doing this work is to use glyphosate. And so that whole system basically goes, the, the alternatives are much more toxic. You know, garlon is commonly used, that's much worse. So anyway, just be aware this is there's outcomes that are not good from that. And then neonics, I, it's the same. Um, neonics are a major problem when they're overused. 
uh, making it hard for people to use it, but keeping it available for purposes. The only thing I'm worried about is that if the, the need, as described in Senator Lena's bill, I'm a little concerned that the agency of ag will actually have the capacity to do that, although Ryan can probably talk about that. Um, but the idea is good, but I don't know how that would work. The main thing I want to talk about is ad adequate shelter for livestock. So we have, we're right on the main road, about four miles from here. I have had three complaints in the summer about inadequate livestock shelter that came through the animal control officer and the state police after the, mostly I think it was from a neighbor that didn't really like that they were grazing pretty close to their house because that's where the property line is. Uh, the, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, anyway, and of course they're sheep in the early summer, they're kind of noisy because the lambs are they're starting to wean the lambs and so they're always talking to each other and they graze all night and they make a lot of noise. So, yeah, they probably weren't that excited about having them yeah. right you know, near their house. How could you not like the sound of a sheep though? <laughs> <laughs> many, many people do. Some of our other neighbors, we use their land and graze on it and they have, we talked and they're like, oh no, we love it, we have no issue. So, it depends. Um, and after the last one of these, I gave the animal control officer and the state police trooper, who was this young guy, about a half hour lecture on the thermal tolerance of sheep and just showed them anyway. After their eyes got sufficiently glazed over, they eventually went away and I haven't heard from them since. There was a, there was a winter one that came on Front Porch Forum when we happened to be away. There was this long discussion on Front Porch Forum about how all the poor sheep were getting snowed on and how it's terrible. And of course, sheep are, uh, they originally are from desert areas. They have a very high oops, uh, heat tolerance. Actually, it's not unlimited. You can definitely have problems, but it's pretty high. And they have really thick sweaters. So <laughs> winters, you know, when it gets really frigid, yeah, it's bad, but a day like today, or it's like this is not a problem for them. So I'm a little worried that any language that was out there could be construed by the people who are worried about this kind of stuff as to requiring buildings at all times. And access to buildings in a grazing system, it's just not gonna happen. I mean, effectively what that rule would do is it would ban all small farm management of livestock. The big confinement areas would be fine, their cows never go outside, um, so that's not a big deal, but all these small farms like ours would not be able to run a grazing system. And if you're gonna put language in saying that someone has to have a good grazing system, okay, fine, who's going to decide that? I mean, my friend Kimberly Hagen from Extension, who many of you may have heard from the other day, um, she is the one who ends up answering some of these questions. I'm the person from my agency who writes a lot of grazing plans. I have no good idea what a good grazing plan looks like. Um, there are people in the agency ag who have a, but who is gonna, who's gonna make this decision? We have this problem internally in my agency all the time. It's like, who's gonna decide that this is a good, you know, proper grazing system? So, anyway, I'm a little worried about this language and, and I'm a little worried that we'll end up with a system that will make it hard to do the kind of good regenerative agriculture management that we actually want people to be doing. So the other thing I want to mention is just this whole business on feeding food waste to chickens. I've heard a few stories from farmers about that. And it strikes me, one of the farmers told me that if the language was changed to include uh, food waste as feed for chickens, then this problem, a lot of this problem would go away. And that is they continue to do that. But it's interesting to me that the legislature will put in this universal recycling law and now we're basically getting rid of one of the major ways of getting rid of the food recyclables. So we, anyway, something needs to be done about that. So. <coughs> Questions for Bruce? Uh, you mentioned that the neighbor was complaining. Were they complaining for the noise, or they thought that you weren't uh, adequate shelter? Adequate shelter was the official complaint. The complaint was that the sheep were out in the sun in the summer on a hot day, and they were, would be suffering from that. That was the complaint. Yeah. 
an animal control officer. I don't know anything about sheep. I have no idea whether this is good or not. And the state police was like, we have no idea whether this is good for sheep or not. I can tell you that uh, in our house committee, I won't speak for the other people, but we, we understand that you know, not every animal needs to be in a enclosed area, and that's probably not the best for them anyway. I mean, like uh, uh, horses are used to being out, and mm -hmm. they know how to take care of themselves. And if you've got this much wool on you, you're probably fine. Thank you. But we do we do understand that there's is a lot. Of this a bill you guys are taking? Because this is the first time I'm yes. hearing of this bill, oh, so yes. we, have, we yes. don't have it in our committee yet. It's age two fifty four, and it's in the House committee. Okay, yeah, got yeah. it. We've taken quite a lot of testimony. Yeah, you want to watch we those bills. <laughs> <laughs> They'll send it over to us yeah. and tell us to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I just had a, a comment. I, sort of a discouraging prospect to think of an animal control officer Googling on your land trying to figure out what they should do. But just, just you know, the, the, the idea that there's more coming at us and, and it's a, it feels like you're being barraged. I think we all feel that. There's 180 legislators, and they're all elected independently, and we all file bills for all sorts of reasons. And, and you know, there are sometimes headlines, legislature considering blah, 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 blah. And that really means one legislator filed a bill, and no one's ever going to consider it. And so, you know, <laughs> this, this is one. This, <laughs> So, you know, I've been attacked. Vermont Senate doing blah, blah. I said, no, this is my bill on something that, you know, in my dream world, in 20 years we would get the votes to do. Like, so I would just ask us all, and the media plays their role. It's not always yeah, helpful. Not they, 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 you know, Rogers wants to ban cell phones for people under 21. That has nothing to do with cell phones, and it has everything to do with guns, and it has nothing to do with any of us other than he figured out a clever ploy, right? So. I just invite everybody to um, not jump on the bandwagon that we've all completely lost our minds and, and people have <laughs> filed bills for all sorts of different reasons and, and, uh, and it's not fair really to the public in a sense that that the media treats them all equally because there we will move maybe 200 bills out of 1200 that get filed and maybe 200 will pass. Well some nights when we go home we think we're in a different building than the rest of here. The <laughs> things are so crazy. So, um, any, uh, anything else? No? I just want to add something too about the ideas of, of allowing the municipalities to impound livestock. And I know of a few stories about this uh, that I've heard of. Yeah, anyway, it's uh, the it's interesting, it's like it might be beneficial to allow it because it's like there are certain select boards that have this as an issue. Um, but requiring the select boards might be too much. Because I know some of the select boards are going to want, I mean, they may want the tools to be able to manage it if there's a problem. But a lot of select boards do not have the capacity, the towns do not have the capacity to do this. Oh, Maybe you that, 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 that when I had this image, yeah, I had this image of like the house and the ground introduced this bill and it's up in government ops and we were just up there on Wednesday uh, trying to um, suggest other ways to do this because I quoted the adequate livestock housing bill and told them they were going to have to build buildings to yeah, put these in yeah, and, yeah. and they didn't think that was a good idea so um, so that's in the house upstairs <laughs> I think, I, think we have I think we better re-examine the house members. <laughs> <laughs> it was Representative Ansel, so we don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bruce. Like yep. okay. I think we have one more person. And then... Good morning. 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 Uh, my name is Jake Guest. Um, my wife, Liz, and I have run an organic vegetable farm and greenhouse business for the last 40 years. We have the good fortune of having just sold our farm, finally, uh, to a young couple who are also organic farmers, and, we're, and it's very exciting that they're taking over the farm. Uh, not our own children, they're elsewhere. Um, we moved to uh, Ely, which is in Thetford, Vermont. Uh, we have 24 acres there, and we're going to continue farming at a much diminished level. Um, 
What I wanted to address today is that, as you are all well aware, Vermont has been uh, subject organic, okay? Vermont has been on the forefront uh, of organic agriculture from the beginning. As you probably also know, Senator Leahy was the sponsor of the original organic uh, <coughs> bill, and our congressional delegation um, has been really supportive of organic agriculture. Uh, organic agriculture in Vermont is an important sec agricultural sector. Um, uh, something is often lost uh, in, in analyzing the economics of, of vegetable growing um, uh, is that because it's such a labor-intensive form of agriculture, we all have uh, large payrolls, but that payroll, those payrolls are spent locally, so vegetable growing um, is a real contributor economically. I just also wanted to say that <clears throat> I represent um, the past president and current board member of the Vermont Vegetable Berry Growers Association. I was a founder of the Natural Organic Farmers Association and currently a member of the Vermont Organic Farmers, which we, we had a meeting just yesterday. Um, a subject which is, we are, the organic movement is at currently at a very critical juncture. Um, as organic food has become, become more and more popular, uh, as we would all expect, large corporations have entered the, entered the field. And um, there, are, there are several segments of this industry which are finding ways to make short, take shortcuts in getting around the organic standards as we understand them. Vermont has set many, uh, several uh, organic dairy farms and many organic vegetable farms and uh, the organic standards have been threatened, we feel, by the allowing of hydroponic, this was mentioned earlier, hydroponic and container grown uh, uh, crops. Uh, they do this on a huge scale. Driscoll strawberries, any, any organic strawberries that you buy in the supermarket, uh, which are from California or not, or not local, are grown hydroponically. Likewise, all the, all the organic tomatoes you find at this time of year are, are not grown, are grown hydroponically. Our objection, uh, and I'm speaking for Vermont Organic Farmers, is that um, this is only possible because the, the, N, the NLP, the National Organic Program, and the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Board, has allowed hydroponic production, even though the original standards clearly state that organic agriculture is implicit and explicit in the definition of organic is that there's a contact with the living soil. And I'm, I was very happy to hear that the Farm Bureau has taken a position uh, to keep the soil inorganic. And that is, uh, there are several farms here uh, in Vermont who are, uh, who are, who have set up a new, uh, I guess we call it an add-on standard, which is, which is called the Real Organic Project, and I, I urge you to go online and look it up. It started really by Dave Chapman, who was in East Thetford. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's testified, I think, in various meetings. Um, and we are urging, just making you aware of this issue. And it affects Vermont, because in Vermont, we, have a, we maintain a stricter standard. We, we, have our, we have standards which specifically disallow organic and container-grown uh, of vegetable production. Likewise, our dairy farms, our organic dairy farms, are, are in really stressed because the allowance by the NOP and NOSB of large confinement animal operations, huge dairies that have no access to outside pasture, although it's mandated in the, in the standards themselves. Vermont farmers are, are, are making sure 
that they comply with the with the spirit and the and the and the word of the law in allowing their animals pasture. In fact, yesterday we had a discussion about whether we're going we're going to demand 120 days or 150 days. Um, anyway, just the yank yeah. because now okay, their yeah. bell is ringing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'd like to make you aware. And please go online and look up the uh, new the Real Organic Project, and also be aware that your dairy farmers, organic dairy farmers in Vermont, are under a lot of pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much to the committee members who come, and thank you, Representative Senator Pearson, for the comment. We try to make sure when we send our report out that we're sending out pertinent information and not the stuff that's. That's the media. No, I think that that was a, that was a great comment. And um, thank you to our members. I think yeah. I'm really excited, the people that we have to speak to you today. You can see the, the width and the breadth of who we represent. It isn't just conventional dairy farmers, as, most, as a lot of people think. We've got a lot of different kinds of members, and they're all paying attention. So um, we will be back in March after crossover, when maybe we'll have a little more pertinent things to discuss. Yep. But we'd really like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank